I'm genuinely feeling a bit nervous, actually. I've been on some fairly major hunting expeditions before, but this one, I think, is about as adventurous and wild as it's ever been. This is the first big hunting trip I've done as a father, and uh, I've got two kids now, and that is something that um, uh, is in the back of my mind. rather strange situation uh, we've had to leave the gun at the airport uh, like in bond and then you have to go back and collect it the next day so um, I'm just rolling with it my guide Sam shirt is here we're ready to go we're now driving through the streets of Kathmandu which has a charming amount of chaos and energy and it's all very interesting I'm feeling a bit spaced out from the flight and um, yeah this is you know um, an amazing place to be so I'm just uh, soaking it all up and um, probably ready for a, a bath and a drink without ice cubes because I'm told um, there's a chance of getting something quite nasty here so we'll see how we go. The tallest place on earth I mean and I've seen it with my own eyes it was as spectacular as I hoped it would be. The scenery around it is just so breathtaking. I'm, I'm a little bit lost for words. I want to go see it closer. I, I, it's given me a sense of actually wanting to go and investigate. I mean, it, it was spectacular to see it like that, but I feel like I need to get into that mountain range and go and see it closer. There's something alluring about it. I can see why people get you know, mountain fever, they want to go climb it. It is a truly, what an achievement to be able to do that in your life and get to the highest point on earth. And just to see it, what a privilege to be able to do that. You know, that's amazing. And we're going to be going not quite as high as that, but you know, that's 28,000 feet. We're going to 19,000 feet, still pretty high. So we're going to be in the snow, in the snow line. So, I mean, that, that really, you know, it's just set the trip. This morning at the airport, uh, we went to collect another hunter who's in our party from the US. He'd been delayed a day on his way out, so we had to go and collect him this morning along with his firearm and go through all the, the paperwork hassle. But it coincided with me needing to go to the airport to collect mine. So we're now a party of three. Uh, cameraman, American hunter, British hunter, and we've got 18 Sherpas waiting for us uh, in the mountains that we're going to meet tomorrow. 18, apparently they carry everything in uh, from tents, tables, food, the whole lot. I am Buddhist, sir. Okay. So morning dam, every day I do it three dams, sir. Okay. Three dams, one dam also okay, sir. And then some dam you have a dam, you do 108 dams. 108 times? Yes, sir. It's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's very nice. So um, this is a, a square of very mixed cultural happenings. You've got... Uh, this Buddhist temple in the middle of it and I'm just I was instructed I walk around it once the wrong well I started to walk around it the wrong way he told me you have to go around it three times the other way and uh, do this with the prayer wheels on the other side of the square we've got five or six youths listening to Dr Dre smoking weed so um, it's kind of slightly strange and there's a guy with an angle grinder so you've got some quite weird things all happening together but uh, I'm just focusing on the Buddhist piece right now because I think that's uh, uh, the most calming and apparently it's going to give me some good luck.
So it looks like we've got a chicken takeaway tonight. Um, but at the moment, it's still alive. So I guess the best way to keep your meat fresh in the mountains is take it in live uh, and have it as fresh as possible. So these uh, Sherpas, not only are they carrying a whole camp, they've also got a rooster on their back living. Uh, I don't know if he's pecking them on the way. Perhaps we'll find out in a minute when we go with them. But um, yeah, quite another very amusing part of the day. So like many millions of people around the world, we will be eating fresh chicken tonight, but I think ours is probably fresher than most people's. Um, any meat that we eat has to be killed, and this is the realities of eating a chicken, uh, a rooster, a cockle in the Himalayas, uh, as fresh as it can be. It was brought in living, and they've just killed it. They've kept everything, kept the blood. Nothing's going to be wasted. They're going to cook that for us, and we're going to eat that tonight. But apparently, the, the first night in camp, it's this kind of ceremonial celebration of everybody coming in. There aren't that many roosters knocking about in the Himalayas, so um, I think from a, a welfare issue, they just bring it into that first day, tap it on the head, uh, and uh, we have that the first night. But that's if you're going to eat meat, you have to face up to this reality. You know, it doesn't come on a. We all, all us hunters say, it doesn't come on a polystyrene tray in the supermarket. This is the real deal. Woke up a few times in the night, but I slept much better than I did in Kathmandu. I think I'm finally burning through the jet lag, which is good. Um, it wasn't the most comfortable sleep mattress I've ever had, but um, I must have slept for on and off for eight hours, which is which is good. So um, feeling refreshed, much more refreshed than I did yesterday. Um, looks like there's been a bit of a frost. I don't know what the temperature must be, just below zero thereabouts. Another clear day, very, very clear sky again. Himalayas. Yeah, that, that is pretty punishing. We've been at it now probably for three hours and we haven't stopped going up. And it's not a steady gradient, it's climbing. And uh, the altitude's definitely affecting me. Recovery rate as we've been getting further is getting longer and longer. So I think we're due to stop for lunch shortly. Need some sugar and some water um, for some more fuel. But yeah, big challenge. Enjoying it, but a big challenge. It's just the recovery rate. It just takes longer to pull oxygen in and recover from it. Even though your legs feel like they've got, got the energy, you just you run out of steam in your, in your lungs and it just takes longer to pull. I mean, I live at sea level where, you know, 11,000 feet now and climbing. So it's just how it goes, I think. And it's only gonna get worse here on in. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm gonna need some food tonight and a good night's sleep. Um, uh, yeah. I hope um, we get better with this altitude because um, if it's like this for 10 days, it's gonna be a really tough hunt. Um, I don't feel that I'm the fitness level that I knew I was when I came, and that must be the altitude. I feel uh, less capable than I thought I would do, so it, it must be the altitude. The scenery is breathtaking. I, I need a few minutes just to go and sit somewhere quietly and take in the day and take in the scenery, because it really is something else. No reference points for this. This is, you know, completely different. Sleep. We're not a brilliant night's sleep. We're leaving early. 
slightly under the um, under head torches to climb another 4,000 feet to get where the sheep are. And we could hear, um, actually it sounded quite like a bird, but it's the sound of a, of a tar exhaling. And the guides heard it, and then suddenly he spots in the, in the gloom, the dark gloom, grey dark, he spots a big bulldog, literally, just, I'm just outside my tent. So we're getting ready for the light to come up in us so that we can identify it properly. And hopefully, I mean, you've got to take your opportunities when they come in this sort of environment. And if this happens and works out, it will be a real blessing. the right animal just for two or three minutes and then he turned to move away made the decision to take him I'm almost certain I smacked him behind the shoulder and he, he dropped but these guys are not 100% sure <sighs> it's excellent Congrats. thank you very much Unbelievable, and look at that scenery. What an experience. What an experience. Himalayan tile in the Himalayas. Wow. Look at that. Look at that. I mean, I, I felt very confident, I'd have hit him hard. I feel the pepper. Just after that huge physical push yesterday to, to be gifted this opportunity now, and the sun's coming up from the Himalayas, it's just very special. Very, very special. That is a beautiful creature. What a what an incredible creature. To shoot an 11 or 12 year old tar, you know, we were after a mature bull. I mean, I'm always impressed and amazed by horn length and, and you know the wonderment of, of how these creatures grow these beautiful horns, but I, I'm not here, I'm not here for inches, I'm here for an experience and to take something this old out of the out of the gene pool to let one of the younger bulls come up through is uh, is is what you're always trying to do and yeah wow what a what, what a stroke of luck that was how lucky was that guys that was very lucky very lucky yeah and you know we're going to be punished for the sheep now it's going to be right at the top <laughs> You can hunt tar in other parts of the world, but there is something special about seeing them in their native range. Currently, the Nepalese government issued 10 tar permits a year, with much of the proceeds going towards conservation initiatives. The species are currently regarded as threatened here by the IUCN, and it is only through regulated hunting that funds are made available to help reduce illegal meat poaching. This is a great example of how hunting can help to preserve a species. <laughs> the other thing that we don't do uh, at home is take the gallbladder off an animal and um, it's herbal medicine, Chinese medicine um, and the gallbladder was taken uh, which is attached to the liver and um, our outfit is actually taking it. His father is ill and he's going to, I don't know how he, whether he drinks it or it's 
sprinkled on something I have no idea but um, you know I've, I've, I've seen it before and, and it's just something that we don't do at home they are literally taking everything the stomach's gone they'll be creating tripe from that I guess and um, but yeah I mean these boys over here are still hard at work um, it, you know it's like a science laboratory here they are literally picking the uh, animal they're fleshing it out and uh, getting it ready to get into the salt um, it, it, they really are masters at this what, what I like seeing more is just how the, the meat's being treated and looked after. Pretty much everybody in camp had something to do during the, um, the process. Um, all 20 people were here. We thought we were going to have quite a kind of relaxed day in camp um, after I got my tar, which, you know, it, that was just so quick paced. It happened really, really quickly. And uh, we were a bit fooled because we were told we had a, a two hour easy trek to camp three. Um, and it ended up being a grueling five hour, um, punishing, very difficult climb. Um, uh, physically, one of the toughest days I think I've ever had in my life. Um, you know, ridiculously steep gradients. Um, and, and we were against the clock because um, we could see that the sun was going down. A lot of it was in shadow and it was freezing, brutally cold. And then when, once the sun started to, to really go away, um, we got super, super cold and the altitude we'd gone from um, 12 and a half thousand feet at camp to, we probably dropped down to 11 and a half thousand feet and then we climbed back up to 14 and a half thousand feet. The guides decided that we should have a rest day in camp to acclimatise to the altitude, but um, little did we know that the other hunter in camp, uh, Matt, uh, they had different plans for him. So at 5am this morning, under um, the light of a headlamp, he climbed another 2,000 feet up to about 16,500 feet, got into a herd of uh, blue sheep and successfully harvested a mature nine-year-old beautiful, beautiful ram. And then after the shot, I had a tough time getting to him. And uh, yeah, and that's when I really started feeling it. And then we packed him up and started walking out. I was like, oh. <laughs> How's your head? It's better now. It hurt really bad up top. But it's good now. I got the, the, uh, the sheep came back into camp and um, 26 people, I think that's how many we've got in camp, descended upon the sheep to process it, skin it. I no doubt we'll be eating some, uh, some sheep today, some mutton, um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So we've got a, a day to take it easy in camp um, and reflect a little bit, soak up some of this awesome scenery. When you're trekking, it's quite hard to soak it all in because physically you're, you're, you know, you're being pushed. But when you've got a few moments to reflect, actually a whole day just to sit here at 14 and a half thousand feet, which you know we're about as high as the highest point in Europe now. This is, you know, this is Mont Blanc height, and we're camping here. So just to, just to sit here and soak it all up is, is, you know, a very special thing actually. And and you know that for me is as much a part of this trip as um, hunting animals. You know, the the final destination is the the animals, but the journey in, on an expedition like this is is, I think more important than, than the trigger pull. Still be in shadow. We're gonna get up there. 
and have a look and see how much how much we can see and whether or not the sheep they saw yesterday is still there. a group of about 12 sheep and there's one mature ram with them they were in this ball field which i've just i've just measured the distance it's still 500 meters away from us so i don't know whether the shot would have been good from here and they've moved around to there's a, there's a day's worth of, of a hard push to get around there i guess all we can hope is that they'll they're now bedded down i guess all we can hope for is that they'll get up and move back this way as the as the day moved on, but they look pretty pretty settled now. I don't fancy our chances of getting round to them. There's millions of tons of rock above us. And um, I, I suspect most of it moves when the snow thaws in the spring, but there'll be landslides all the time. It's a pretty airy place. spotted it as we were walking back to camp i found it with my beady eyes so i'm feeling good about myself having had 12 hours on my feet having climbed a near-death boulder field and probably climbed about 3,000 feet so it's a nice way to round the tail
<laughs> I can't, I can't describe it. <laughs> wow. Let me look at the altitude. I'm just keen, you know, this is possibly the highest I'm ever going to go on foot. It'll certainly be the highest I ever shoot an animal. 15,625 feet is where he lies, which I think is testament to how hardy these are. You know, moving five, five feet and you're out of breath. And these guys live up here all the time. It's the weather started to close in a bit and you can see the wind's picked up. It's much colder uh, than it has been. And this is unquestionably the, the best hunt of my life and the most memorable. It's sometimes hard to explain why we travel to distant lands to hunt, to pursue magnificent and majestic animals far from home. But for many of us, it is far more than the sole focus of a species. It is about adventure and culture, understanding and learning from new people in new places. It is about challenging ourselves in environments we have no baseline for. As we packed up to leave the mountains behind, I couldn't help but feel changed by my experience. I had learned a lot about myself and what I am truly capable of. My guides had imparted knowledge and wisdom upon me, and I now had a deep connection with the landscape, its people, and two of its most impressive species. For me, I must understand that my actions and impact as a hunter are positive, both to the species I pursue and to the native people. Our expedition employed no less than 30 people for two weeks, with tips also given individually to every single person who helped to make it a success. In these remote rural parts of the country, this makes a considerable impact on local communities. Our government issued permits, which there were only 20 for blue sheep and 10 for tar that year, directly helped to fund the conservation of both species. There was also a community charge levied on every animal taken, then given to the local communities. With a responsibility and vested interest in the survival of these species, such initiatives help to protect animals such as tar and blue sheep against poaching. I doubt anything will quite compare to my adventure in Nepal. <laughs>